I'm State Representative Janine Nodder, and this is Chatting with Janine Presents the House of Lords. <laughs> it's a term that I use, it's a term of endearment, it's what I call the Senate. And my guest on this special episode is Senator Tim Lang. Also known as Lord Lang, I guess. Lord <laughs> Lang. <laughs> I didn't think of that, but I like that. So thank you for coming to Merrimack, Lord Lang. I'm going to call you that through the show. So before we get into the issues, I want to hear about the Beer Caucus. Ah, the Beer Caucus. As, as you know, Jeannie, uh, when I was a freshman in the House of Representatives, so my first time I ran was in 16, and I was elected in 16, and 17, and 18, um, we had a couple of us state representatives who were freshmen always felt we were outside leadership. They didn't really care about freshmen. And I remember so, those days. And so uh, we formed a little group, and it started off with literally after uh, we, we, had, we have the softball game, Republican versus Democrat softball game we started. Um, and after one of the practices, one of the guys brought some beers, and we sat on tailgate, and we started talking politics. And it became a thing where we would use, we would get together. I was on Ways and Means, uh, Senator Pearl, that then Representative Pearl, was on agriculture. Uh, Representative Panacetti was, was on commerce. Um, Representative Moffitt was on education. And so the different committees basically could get together and talk about what the committee bills were, what was going on, what was the exciting bills in that committee, and give us better insight. Because as you know, with 1,200 bills mm -hmm. in a year, it's awful hard. Yes. And so the Beer Caucus was founded at that. And since then, we've, we've been doing a lot of fundraisers. We do so again um, for in, in six years, roughly seven years, we've raised over $50,000 for various charities. Um, usually it's veterans charities that we give money to. A couple awesome. years ago, we swapped it. We split the money between veterans charities and domestic violence charity. We do things like golf tournaments and the softball tournament. We're going to do a cornhole tournament, we're hoping, in the fall. Oh, fun. Um, and uh, again, we raise the money. We don't keep any of it. 100% goes to whatever the charity of choice is. That's awesome. I know one time you got to go up to the... Oh, what do you call that? The dome. You got to yes. go up to the dome. Well, and, and, and a shout out to Joe Burke, who's the chief uh, of, of, the, uh, cha of the house. Um, Joe and I went to elementary school together, and I talked him into taking us up there, oh. and then he got in trouble for it. Really? Yeah, yeah. He got well, a lecture you know from Terry Path because oh. he wasn't supposed to have us up there. But we had, about, we had a bunch of the Beer Caucus members went up, and we got to go up to the Golden Dome and into that area and look out over yeah. the city of Concord. I've been um, there, too. Incredible history up there. You oh, see all yes. the names that are written in. Right, right, and, and the else. dates. I, ha I yeah. saved them on my phone. I got yeah. to go up once. So, yeah, so, so yeah, we, the Beer Caucus got a, got a, a illicit trip. Up to the state dome, um, and and uh, but it was really it was fun. It was a great time. We we enjoy talking politics, enjoy educating each other again because twelve hundred bills you don't know them all, and so talk to people in different committees. You find out more of the details of exactly because I, I was just talking to a a candidate um, for the next term, mm -hmm. and I, she was saying I don't know that I understand all these bills. I said, well, you know, I don't understand every bill from every committee either. That's why we get together and we talk to each other. Um, to learn what's going on in the different committees because, I mean, nobody has time to sit through every single hearing. There's just not enough hours in the day to do that. Uh, a lot of people don't recognize that a lot of time you put a lot of faith in your chairman, mm -hmm. right? So the people that are running, running the committee or if you're in a minority, a ranking member, right? And that they'll bring forward any bills of real consequence that we need to talk about and you accept a lot of what goes on in committee. Um, sometimes you push back. Uh, we've had a couple times we push back, and I remember when I was on Ways and Means, um, oh, what was his name? He was from Nashua, um, Scully, uh, Representative Scully, um, really opposed something Ways and Means did on a unanimous uh, version. And we ended up, once we got a little more detail on it, we all agreed, and we flipped the vote on the floor. From, yeah, that uh, you, happens sometimes. You know, yeah. But you do that because someone brings up to your attention. When you read the bill and you hear the testimony, sometimes you have one version. It's, okay, this is what it means. And then someone else comes forward and brings you some other piece of testimony. Oh, I hadn't considered that. I hadn't thought about that, right? And so you adjust your opinion. You adjust your vote. Um, and that's what uh, Kevin Scully did down in Nashville. He brought it was uh, on a Ways and Means bill about dunning messages on tax bills. Mm -hmm. um, and he had an opinion and he came forward and the more we fleshed it out, the more it made sense. And we ended up overriding the uh, uh, vote, the uh, committee vote, a unanimous committee vote at that. So I've been in for 14 years now. Mm -hmm. And I, I decided that I would run for re-election. So I'm announcing that on this Congratulations. show. Congratulations. Thank you. So right now I'm the senior member in, in Merrimack. Um, and there's some hot issues out there. And I asked you to be on the show because you're, you're very well versed on the education freedom accounts. And um, I wanted to go over those because the other side is not telling the truth. <laughs> I went to one of the town council meetings, one of our 
Representatives is also on the town council, and what she was saying was completely false. Mm -hmm. She was saying that uh, all of a sudden, talking like a fiscal <coughs> conservative, which we know that that side is not, and she's saying that the, the education freedom accounts are fiscally irresponsible. She says that they're going to raise tax, uh, property taxes, like, oh, just you wait, they're going to raise them. I'm like, but actually, just the opposite is true. So Anybody who knows math, who can do simple math, not, I'm not talking about common core <laughs> math, but simple math, knows if it's $26,000 a year per student to, in, the, in the public school, if a student is no longer in the public school, then that's a savings of $26,000, right? Right. Is so, that right so the math. Wrong? Right. So you're right. So again, the math. So I'm going to correct you on one thing. It's twenty thousand dollars is the average. Well, I think Merrimack in, is twenty six. Oh, Merrimack, Merrimack, yeah. Merrimack maybe, but statewide, the the average cost of a child for full load, meaning local taxes, state taxes, all the money put in for a child is averages around twenty thousand dollars per student. Under the education freedom accounts, the only tax dollars that are spent for that same student is five thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So this, and it's state so, dollars, no so local dollars. So tell me how it's going to cost us more for right. spending five thousand dollars per student versus twenty six thousand dollars per right. student. So again, so that's a, again, it's it, the only it's there's the amount of money spent in taxation for that student that's now chosen an alternative path of education is five thousand dollars, and that's one hundred percent state dollars, no local dollars whatsoever for that student to attend. Uh, it was part of the EFA program. No, they also keep calling them vouchers. They are not vouchers. Yeah, I, I gave up on that argument. It's tomatoes, tomatoes, right? I mean, I, it, it's 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 a it's a. Some people call them grants, education savings accounts. They call them grants, scholarships, uh, scholarships, right? So it, it's phraseology. Of course, they're going to use phraseology on the other side that makes us look bad, right? That's just their nature, right? Rather than just call it what it is, it's, it's a tax grant, right? We're giving a scholar. It's giving a scholarship to a student. I, I'd call it a scholarship myself, mm -hmm. um, but um, but again, that's politics. And how does it work? How does the how do EFAs work? So the current level is 350% of poverty. So if a if a family is under 350% of poverty, um, the poverty level, then they can and they want to take their kid and their the school the public school is not working for their child for whatever reason. It could be a, a plethora of reasons. I have four kids myself. I know that each one of them learn differently, um, mm -hmm. and each I one six. I dealt with differently. Um, and so if a parent thinks that the public school system isn't working for that child, um, they can take them out of the public school, they get a $5,000 grant, and they can pick a school that they like. And it could be another public school, right? They could go from Merrimack inside Concord, where I work as a better school, I'm gonna take my $5,000 and go, mm -hmm. and go to Concord, and I'll pay the difference in tuition to the Concord public school, right? It's not always private school, it could also be public school that they go yeah, to. Yeah, they keep pushing it like it's all, all Catholic yeah. school or something like that, but it's, but it's, it's not, not. Right, so it could also be a Catholic school, uh, again, but, um, so it depends on each child, but that parent would get, 50, I think the average grant is $5,300 or right around that area, $5,200. They would get that much money to go towards the tuition or whatever school they want to send their kid to. And the parent is obligated for the rest. Mm -hmm. So stop and rewind or just watch this program over and over again until you, you have the truth because <laughs> I'm tired of, of hearing them twist it and tell lies. <sighs> so again, this flyer. Any, anybody who's a parent recognize that each, A, you don't have a favorite child, not supposed to anyway, um, and B, each of your kids learn differently, right? Mm -hmm. Some are some are auditory, they hear by listening, some are visual, some are kinetic, they learn by doing. Um, and so you have to adapt the learning style to that child. And so um, saying that every child can fit the mold, right, That's of public true. school isn't necessarily true. So if we have compulsory education, which we do in New Hampshire, right? Kids, parents don't have a choice saying, I'm not gonna send my kid to school at all. They have to send their kid to school. Then giving, a, especially those low income families or moderate income families that don't have the financial means an, an option. You know, mm -hmm. give, just giving back the state dollars that we use to spend on education, not local dollars, state dollars, and allowing them to find a better choice for their child is, is extremely important to every parent who wants a great education for their child. Now, there's some who are who say that um, there should be no tax, there should be no cap, that everybody should be entitled to EFAs. And uh, the little old man that sits next to me was saying, nope, I don't want rich people getting this. I'm like, well, you, rich people have kids in the public school and we're spending 20,000, the average is $20,000 a year. <laughs> right. So you're talking about, again, a universal scholarship. Um, so uh, I think that you know, to your point, we subsidize our education by sending them to the public school, 
right? And, and we're that millionaire who's, whose kid is going to public school. We're not saying, oh, no, you're not entitled to any of the local tax dollars because you're rich. You have to, you have to uh, pay for your kid to go to public school. So um, it's kind of a hard argument. Again, I, I'm, I'm a, a believer in the scholarship program. I think that it, it served lots of parents. Like we're up to 4,200 kids, one of the most popular EFA growing programs in the country. Um, I think it serves the kids, the parents well. Um, and I think that um, expanding it and, and moving it forward incrementally so we can watch what progress is and watch what happens. A lot of them complain about the fact that they say kids that go to these private schools um, or involved in EFAs aren't tested, right? There's no accountability, um, which is absolutely not true. Um, so if you go, if you're a homeschool child or an EFA child, there are three ways that you can, um, you have to have accountability for your grading to see if you're on grade level, right? You can take the state standardized test just like every other public school, that's one way. Oh yeah, right? I used to homeschool and yeah. I, my kids are old now, but um, when they were little, they, we did have to take those So the those tests, So same thing is true, they have to take the standardized test, they could take, that's one way. Another one is they can have a, what they call a portfolio that a, a certified teacher will look over and say, this is on grade level. And there's another one, I always forget the third one. <laughs> so oh. I don't remember what the third one is off the top of my head. I just lost it again. Um, but there are three mechanisms where children are tested. It's not like we give you the money and you just go off with your kid and no one, no one checks on you, right? There are, there are validation components in this that take care of it. On top of that, there are um, the Department of Education randomly picks, uh, does audits of, of accounts to make sure how the money was spent. Mm -hmm. um, so if you're a parent receiving, you may be caught up in an audit um, by the Department of Education who says, goes to the scholarship program that manage, does the administration of those accounts for us and says, show us an account, show us where the money was spent, every dollar. And there has not been a mass exodus from the public schools since nope. the EFA program has started. No, again, it, it's... Um, there's no mass exodus. So, I mean, as it is, just in education. So I serve on a set of education committees, so we get those briefings. Um, so the est the right now we're estimated to lose about 1% of student population per year for the next 10 years, right? So understand that when you see re reducing, when I was on the school board in Winnesquam, I think at, at back a decade or so ago, 15 years ago, we had over two, almost 200,000 kids in the, in the school program. We're down to under 160,000, 158,000, I think is the no latest number. So the education has been declining. <clears throat> Enrollment's been declining in all public schools across the state. EFAs aren't accelerating that. Again, and even if it did, we give phase-out grants to schools. So That's right. Right? Yeah, so when a that. school loses a student to EFAs, and they lose that, that revenue, because that, the $5,000 no the longer follows the child into mm -hmm. the new school program, um, that we still pay the public school for two years, for actually three years. Um, you get 100% the first year, 50% the second year, and 25% the third year for a student that even no longer exists in the school system. Um, and it, again, it's to give those public schools a chance. You know, government doesn't turn on the dime. It's the one thing I've learned in, in my public service, mm -hmm. right? Government doesn't turn on dime. It needs time to adjust. And so we give those phase-out grants to the public schools for students that are no longer there to give them time to adjust and adapt to, to the, the loss of that student or the population. What are some other hot button issues that are going to be an, um, an issue this time around the selection season? Um, well, abortion is always a, you know, the, the Fetal Protection Act is always a big argument, right? And I think that most people misunderstand what that bill is. Exactly. Um, I, think, I think many people don't, they hear uh, the, the sound bite of the left, which is, you know, Republicans want to take away choice. You don't want to give you any choice, you know, you, no bodily autonomy whatsoever. And that's just absolutely not true. And again with the math, people don't know how to do math. When, right. when you say 24 weeks, they have no idea. They think 24 weeks is, is 15 right. days. Yeah. 24 weeks is six, six months. months. Right. So before the Fetal Life Protection Act, there was no laws on the books, which means abortion was legal all the way up till birth. Mm -hmm. That's extreme all the way up till birth. We only banned late-term abortion, and even with that, there are exceptions. I have the RSA. I think I'm going to have to carry it around with me <laughs> because uh, people uh, have been told wrong information. Right. So, so again, one of the things we did with the Fetal Protection Act, and we passed that when I was in the House, um, was 
align that bill with also, you remember, we also have the fetal homicide law, which was the first time we've actually right. had somebody charged with, right? So if a pregnant woman who is in a car accident or something happens where that results in the death of the, of the fetus, the baby, um, they can be charged with a second homicide, mm -hmm. right? So how can on one hand you say that a baby is not a human being, right, in terms of abortion, but for the purposes of charging somebody with homicide, we're gonna say it is, right? That's inconsistent state policy, right? So what we did was we aligned state policy. We said that we, we've met a, a compromise at 24 weeks that says after 24 weeks, now there are two lives involved, right? There's the mother and the child, and at that point, there, there are concerns for both. And um, so again, I think it's an extreme position to say um, there should be no controls whatsoever. That right up to the moment of birth or, or the day before birth, you can abort your, your child. Right. Right. I think that is an extreme position. Anybody who's looking for a totally unregulated abortion right. uh, And there process. are exceptions in the law. So if, <coughs> right. like, if like there's an emergency, then they're not really killing the baby. They're, right. They're so help the, the mother and, and, again, the, and the baby dies as a result. baby dies in, 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 in utero. Um, Again, that's not an abortion anymore, right? right. So it's called a different, I forget the name, it begins with a D, but it's a, different, it's a different phrase for what they do when they remove a, a dead fetus from a pregnant woman's uh, mm -hmm. body. It's not considered an abortion right. um, on, by statute. And so, again, we made, a, we made exceptions in the law to right. deal with those the, extreme if, circumstances. Like, if extreme, the child has a, a medical condition, Mm -hmm. then it's, they're legally allowed to, to have right. an abortion. So it's just, I mean, six months, after yeah. six months, right. that's a long time. That's a half a year to be pregnant. So seventh month, seventh, eighth, nine, you just can't decide, well, I don't want it. Right, exactly, <laughs> right. So again, we have unrestricted abortion for the first six months. For no reason, any reason you want an abortion, you can get an abortion in New Hampshire, as, as I think it was President Obama, they're safe. Uh, legal and we hope hope rare, um, but um, but for the first six months that's true. You can do it in New Hampshire with no no oversight whatsoever. You don't have to check with anybody. After six months, now we're dealing with balancing two lives and the need for two lives. We've created certain mm -hmm. exceptions relative to, like you said, fetal anomaly and those kind of things. Um, but um, yeah, uh, again, misnomer by the left, right? Yes. They like to say we want an absolute ban and... and well, that's what, I think that's <coughs> what they told the voters last time because we had people coming up and yelling at us. They said, yeah. you banned abortion in New Hampshire. I said, you can call a clinic right now and make an appointment. <laughs> oh, I will do that. So I hope those people did actually do that call because <laughs> they will find out that they were lied to. I, I will tell you, it is amazing if you have a really good conversation with somebody. So I was up at Plymouth State College for homecoming last year with Representative Moffitt, where he's, a, he's an alumni, my, uh, two of my children are alumni from Plymouth State. Yep, my daughter too. And um, we were up there, and of course, Rep. Moffitt likes to put me on the spot. And so there was a young lady there, and, um, and of course, Mike said, Senator Lang voted for the Fetal Protection Act, and, and, and the girl was like, abortion, and I'm like, yeah, she goes, I don't think you guys should be touching abortion. And we had almost a 45 minute conversation, me and this 22 year old young lady, um, and by the time I was done, she agreed with me, right? Wow. She agreed, right? But it was, she didn't understand the law, right? She was listening to the left talking points that just say they're banning abortion. Because they well, don't tell the truth. Well, they don't tell the whole <laughs> truth, right? So they take this, they selective, they, they use selective facts, right? To, mm -hmm. to make their point. And um, is it true you can't, we have restrictions on abortion after six months? Yes, that's a true statement, right? Uh, I'm not gonna try and hide from it, it's a true statement. There's a reasons for that, because it was a compromise between the life of the mother and the life of the child. Um, and so, um, but after, like I said, I had almost a 45 minute conversation to this young 22 year old girl from Plymouth State. Um, and in the end, she goes, wait, I think I might be Republican. It's, uh, because we, she ended up agreeing with me. She didn't mm -hmm. realize what the law said, what yeah. the law did. She had a, a ton of questions for me, um, which I answered all honestly. I'm like, no, that, that, you know, here's what it says, right? And so, uh, but I think people just need to be informed, right? I think the problem is they, we're kind of a soundbite mentality uh, public, right? And so yeah. they hear, they're trying to ban abortions. And that's what you and, hear. Right, and then also the other side, they will like repeat the same thing right. over and over and over again until people believe it as truth. Right. Right. And so like, I used to be a police yeah. prosecutor and I, I always that. followed the right. rule of a judge has to hear a fact three times before he'll believe it. The first mm -hmm. time he hears, he goes, okay, I know that fact. Second time he goes, yeah, I heard that before. And the third time he hears, he goes, I already know this. Can you move on, please? Right. And I think the public's kind of the same thing. The, the left just hammers that 
ohm after over and over and over again, and pretty soon it becomes an established fact when it is, in fact, not a fact no. uh, at all. The word Pravda comes to mind. The word what? Pravda. Yeah. <laughs> Pravda is, was the Soviet Union's um, news. Uh, yeah. 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 So, yeah. so again, it, it's just their way of driving home their maybe, point. Maybe people today don't know what the Soviet Pravda. Union is. <laughs> what Pravda <laughs> is. I don't know what communism <laughs> is. <sighs> so, so yeah. So Different again, world. I think that that'll be a conversation point um, that'll be coming up as as as, uh, as we talk about various topics on the campaign trail. Will mm -hmm. be again explaining that. I'll have I'll have a lot more of those forty five minute conversations um, yes. with people who explain well, you know, what the law. Two cycles ago, I was talking to people who wouldn't call themselves conservatives, mm -hmm. um, but they did say late term abortion is extreme mm -hmm. and they and I'm so and most people believe that so I don't understand all the fuss <laughs> well again so it, it is like I think the number 75 percent of 70 to 75 percent of New Hampshire residents oppose late term abortion mm -hmm. right so in the sixth seventh and eight, or the seventh eighth ninth month right they oppose that right so yeah. again the devil's in the details mm -hmm. right and so uh, with the left message of Republicans are trying to ban abortion Right, uh, uh, and that mantra, it, it it's hard to overcome with real facts. No, that's not what we did. Here's what we did, right? Mm -hmm. And having that conversation. So it's just a lot of 45 minute conversations, you know, explaining to people and talking to people. Um, you know, I have to be honest, I was in a debate for my Senate seat as a, my first time senator with, with uh, a meet the candidates night with, we had four House members, two on two Democrats and two Republicans and me and the Democratic senator that was trying to, was running for the Democratic opponent. And um, but when I was all done, everybody but one per, one Democrat agreed with my statement that yeah yeah we didn't ban abortion, right? Even the Democrats, right? Record had to acknowledge yeah no he's right. This mm -hmm. is it is extreme to say that right up to the moment of birth. But when we tried to when they tried to repeal the Fetal Life Protection Act, every Democrat voted to repeal it, mm -hmm. which means that they voted for abortion up Late to term. birth without exception. Absolutely true. And then that that I'm sorry, but that's extreme. Yep. Um, another top hot topic is, of course, the um, women's sports. <laughs> yes, yes, the biological sex and sports bills. Um, so we had three of those bills this year, one House bill, two Senate bills. I was the prime sponsor of one bill. Senator Avar was the prime sponsor of the, another bill. And I think Caitlin Katab. Oh, I don't remember she? who was, I don't remember who was 1205, who were the prime well, was, was it 1205. Uh, was it Moffitt? Who? Well, I know Moffat was there. Oh no, Andrus, Louise Andrus was oh, the uh, prime. Right. Representative Andrus yes, was the prime. Yes, I did testify because yep. I was asked to be the prime sponsor. So again, so um, this bill we passed in the Senate, we merged Senator Avard's bill and my bill into one under Sen Senator Avard. Um, I like him. And, and yep, Kevin's a great guy. Uh, we merged our bills um, and we passed his bill on a party line vote, right? And it was strictly acknowledging that on a physiological basis, that right. biologically boys have advantages. They right? do. They, they have, uh, in, a, in a study put out by, just recently, by the Manchester University of Sports and, and something else, out in, Euro in Europe, um, in response to the um, Olympic Committee, uh, these 28 researchers, 29 researchers got together and, and ended up doing a research study. And it came out that men have 50% more upper body strength, right? 40% more lower body strength. They, they have a speed uh, advantage. They have uh, the way, it's called VO2 max. The way their lungs process oxygen is different than a woman, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to acknowledge that in the competitive sports environment, those physiological advantages turn into a disadvantage for a biological female, mm -hmm. right? And so, um, and it turns into potentially safety problems, right? We read about Massachusetts, the, the trans female who was playing in a female basketball game who literally ragdoll. If you don't know what a ragdoll is, when you literally grab a player and just toss them like, they're, like they're a ragdoll. And so there was a, 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 a game in, in Massachusetts, basketball game, three girls were injured, one of them ragdolled by a biologi biological uh, male, and uh, the team forfeited. They gave up, right? And a lot of the complaints we hear about that is, well, Tim, biological girls aren't coming forward and asking for this, right? So why are you pushing this? And the reality is, you want to know a good example of why biological girls aren't coming to, uh, 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 up and forward? Is look what happened in West Virginia this last three weeks ago. There was a track and field event, shot put event, 
there was a trans female playing, five of the West Virginia girls decided they were going to protest. And so they did, they did what they call a non-throw. They walked into the circle and then just didn't throw their shot put and stepped out as a protest to the trans male and stating it was a protest to the trans male. So what was their penalty for, what was their cheering rah-rah for them for this political incorrectness that they did? They got banned from the track and field for the next, for the rest of the year. So they because they made a political statement, they said, I, we're not gonna compete with boys. And they made that statement. And what, was the, what did the uh, school do? They banned them from the sport for the rest of the year. Wow. And so, so imagine, like, I got broad shoulders. I'll take the beatings, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and you know, I, I, Dan Innes, Senator Innes, and I were just talking about this today about the amount of hate mail we get from that, from that um, Oh, industry. we all get love letters. Yep. And, and, but what I said, Dan, I said, could you imagine, though, if a 16-year-old, you know, regular, uh, biological girl came in and testified in favor of the bill? how she would be called a bigot and transphobic and intolerant because she was stating her opinion that no, boys have a physiological advantage. I shouldn't have to compete do, against well, the boy. And the hips. So women have, you know, we have guys just kick their legs out this way and we kind of have to go around because we have well, our I'll, hips. I'll, I'll, I'll trust you on that one. But, <laughs> <laughs> but again, you know, the, 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 the complete lack of science that they're willing to look at, right? The fact that science is crystal clear for, for centuries, we've, you know, and, and, and even, like I said, this study just, just a couple of weeks ago was issued in March, uh, maybe April of this year, by the 29 researchers who were criticizing the Olympic Committee's um, memo on, bo on men playing in women's sports. And, um, and they said, no, no, it's not, that's not fair at all, right? It creates safety factors. It's also just not fair. It's the, it creates an inherent fundamental unfairness against women. Um, yeah. And you, you know, most candidates try to hide from all the controversial stuff, but I just, you know, it's just me. This is what I believe in. <laughs> I don't hide it. I, so it's, mm -hmm. to me, it's not about controversial or non-controversial. It's, again, I, I've coached middle school and high school um, soccer, um, boys and girls. Um, School in this bill, the bills we had forward, both of them provided for a co-ed option, right? But but the idea being that if a biological female says I'm playing on the female team, they're at a comp they're not at a competitive disadvantage again for that team, right? Sports is not a zero sum game, meaning I mean sports is a zero sum <clears throat> game, meaning that if if a trans female gets on a team. I've cut players before from my teams, which means that a biological female got cut from that opportunity to play in sports for a trans female athlete, mm -hmm. right? Who has biological advantages, right? And they're and so, winning. And, they're, and, they're, and, well, the they're tier size, they're taking, right? You know, the the scholarships are all going to the to the trans person. Uh, again, I don't. Know, they're starting again. University of Washington issued its first uh, D one scholarship to a trans female on the volleyball team. I don't know what um, that means. D so. What's that? What is D1? So colleges are broken up D1, D2, D3. So D1 are the top highest high-end schools, right? So they're the larger schools that are, can issue full-blown scholarships. A D3 can't issue a scholarship. D2 can and D1 can. Mm -hmm. um, and so the D1 school, uh, is, is so the University of Washington is a D1 school, um, large university system. They issued their first scholarship for girls volleyball to a trans male, a trans female, I should say. Um, and so now we're starting to see opportunities being taken away. Because again, that scholarship is being taken away from a biological girl. That may have been their only way they could have gone to college. And yet now that's being taken away right. from them. Um, here in New Hampshire, we had the, Keir the Kearsage Estate, the track meet in Kearsage, where a trans female won the girl's high jump um, by over three inches, um, I think it was. And the... Um, I got a phone call from one of the parents on the team talking about the fact that there was a high school biological girl because you're only allowed so many players to go to state that got didn't, never didn't make a once in a lifetime opportunity to go to the state meet and didn't make it because a trans male, a trans female took the, took the spot, mm -hmm. the 12th spot. And so, so never again. Those are, those are opportunities that in their high school career will never come again and yet they were taken away from a person who, again, I, I just look to the science and the medical of it, right? The medical science. Right, it has science. nothing to do with, with hate. And nothing to do with no. hate. It's about safety so and about fairness. We actually have friends, mutual yeah. friends, who are considered themselves trans. Yep, yep. I, I have gay friends, I have trans friends. I, I don't, you know, that's fine. Um, but again, it's about fairness and about safety. 
right? Exactly. And it's unsafe to have someone with that much physiological advantage and it's unfair to the girls, right, to lose their spot to someone who has a biological advantage and is choosing to not play out on the team of biology. So what we did was we, we just divided sports by sex, right, biological sex. It's not by gender. Don't care what your gender is. If you're biologically a boy, you play on the boys' team. You're biologically a girl, you play on the girls' team. Or a school has an option of making a co-ed team. Then any player who's signing up knows what they're getting in, up, getting in for. If I'm a girl signing up for girls' team, I'm gonna, I know I'm going to play with girls. If I'm a boy signing up for a boys' team, I know I'm going to play with boys. Mm -hmm. There's some who want to. I went to high school with a girl who played on football. She, but she didn't change with the boys. She went into the right. ladies' room to, yep. to change. But well, she shaved that, her head and so played football. So let's see the crazy piece, right? So, you know, I, I had daughters. I have two daughters. And the fact that I would think that my 13 or 14 year old daughter is in a locker room and has to change with a boy, right? With boy parts, right? Yeah, I don't like changing uh, in front of anybody. Any parent should cringe about that idea. Number one, never mind the fact that, again, we talk about body image a lot, right? Especially how teen girls go through all those problems around body image, right? And now you're gonna put them in a, in a situation where they have to get ready for a away game in a locker room with a boy. Right, right and change their clothes so they're going to be hiding in the corner right and they're going to be um so again I, I i worry about why are we doing that for the majority of the team to to support one person right why let that person go change where they in with their body parts right so i don't even like using the restroom if it's if it's not a ladies room because <laughs> if it's not a ladies room it's a men's room it smells yeah. like a men's room there's evidence that it's uh -huh. a men's room I no. think we see more businesses going to all gender bathrooms, right? right. And they're well, doing instead of we men's and women, Vermont. but they're usually single stalls, right? So. No, we were in Vermont and it was a multi stall bathroom and it was all gender. And I'm like, ah, uh. so my husband and I walked floor in. Floor to ceiling panels? Yes. Usually those are floor to ceiling panels. When right. They do all I, well, my husband and I walked in and I'm like, oh. I yeah. said, okay, well, let's. Let's go real quick before a man comes in. Well, there was a man in there. I'm like, ah, okay, well, I'll just wait. Can't do it. I, just, I can't. And the guy, he apologized. Well, again, he felt bad. Absent all that stuff, again, for me, it's just about science, medical science, physiological science. Um, so making sure that um, our girls are safe and they don't lose opportunity mm -hmm. um, due to medical science and ignoring so, medical science. I think one of the um, campaign issues for, for the Democrats this time around is going to be, they're going to say, feed the children, feed the children. Mm -hmm. uh, Maureen Mooney is very, very well versed on this because mm -hmm. she's on the finance committee on, on how much it will cost to feed all the school kids before school, after school, lunchtime, mm -hmm. and um, during the summer at taxpayers' expense. Mm -hmm. um, I'm thinking, why don't they just go retire from politics and, and make sandwiches, you know? So again, the, the, yeah, there was, we've had several bills on that. I chaired the commission last year, the House Senate Commission on, on to study this issue about moving to like, uh, you know, 300% of poverty levels for free and reduced and what that would mean. Um, and we gave some outlines. Um, the problem is nobody looked at, nobody followed the outlines. If they would have submitted bills that were in alignment, possibly we could just support them, but they didn't. They went crazy and there's way, way bigger, um, the education trust fund, you know, you got to remember education, education will be a big, uh, education funding will be a big conversation this year coming up. Yeah. Um, so I was the author of the education funding formula that we adopted this year. Um, I spent almost eight to 10 weeks um, designing that formula with a focus of, um, we, we increased money for special education, we increased money for free and reduced per student, for, per school, um, but we also did, um, a differential aid relative to property values, right? The amount of money that the citizen, the a student, the Rai needs to raise for their students is different than Pittsfield, right? And so Pittsfield needs a little more help. It doesn't have the million dollar homes that Rye has on the on the ocean. And so um, we made a differentiated aid. We, we gave more money to those property poor towns that are struggling without actually taxing their people, their citizens out. We gave them a lot more money. And, you know, it, I find it ironic that the city of Claremont, who is one of the, you know, Claremont decision, right, the education funding decision, they get over $10,000 per student in education funding. The judge ruled that we should only be paying seventy three sixty five. Mm. Right, but because of differentiated aid, we recognize Claremont has a high population of free and reduced. They have low property values, so they need a little more help. So we've given them a little more help, um, and that town a little more help. But they're suing us, saying we didn't give them enough. And yet, the judge's ruling would have us cut their funding by almost thirty percent. 
um, wow. if I just follow the strict letter of the judge's funding. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, education funding will be, again, I think this is one of those, it's a really complex topic. Um, but I think that the state's doing you know, what it should. We, rate, we spent over the biennium $169 million more in education this last biennium, this last budget cycle, um, through my formula and some other additions we made to the budget. Um, and so I think we're doing a good job at, at dealing with funding and funding of education. I think there's more to do next year if I make it back, knock on wood. Um, I'm going to be spoke, focusing on special education. Right. This year, I kind of just revamped the formula to deal with property poor towns. Next year, I'm going to be looking at how we deal with catastrophic aid. Right. How do we deal with these communities who get one kid who comes to the community and costs a quarter of a million dollars because of special needs, uh, of education needs? Um, that catastrophic aid needs to be bolstered so local taxpayers aren't dealing with that mm -hmm. bulk of that share. So next year, my goal on education funding is to look at how we're dealing with catastrophic aid for these towns that have kids come in. I think it was around here, Hudson, um, Hudson or Pelham, one of the two, I was right in that area. Yeah. They had Thanks a half a million other. dollar shortfall because of one student moved into town. They had to do, they had to have a special appropriations meeting oh. to fund more money because of one student. Wow. Right? And so we need to fix some of that at the state level. So I want to, mm -hmm. next year, I know that when I look at the education funding formula again, assuming I get elected again, um, I yeah. will look at that. We'll, we'll expand that. We'll, again, we'll deal with the funding, um, but we'll also look at special education and how we can better serve towns that have catastrophic needs students. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of special needs kids yeah. in Merrimack, a lot. Yeah. So it's that, it's that hard balance, right? So special needs is someone simply on you know, ADHD, right? It could be classified as special needs and qualify under right. that category. Yeah. Um, you don't almost don't want to incentivize to have more kids diagnosed, right? Because you, you, by the more kids you have, the more money you get that are diagnosed with that as an add-on. So it's a real tough balancing act. Um, but there are some, um, when it comes to catastrophic aid, I think that's where we need to focus some of our dollars on in the state is to deal with these communities that have uh, very expensive children that are that are being in the in the inclusion model that we use are being included into the public school system that just cost a quarter of a million dollars, a half million dollars. Um, we need to deal with how we fund that a little bit better rather than dump that on the local property taxpayer. Another talking point for the other side is they they're it's in Merrimack. Um, <laughs> the Democrat candidates are saying, um, well, we want to lower property taxes. Okay, so the, next, the first question you have to ask is, oh, how are you going to do that? Well, if they push for an income tax, mm -hmm. they think that will lower the property tax. But that has not worked in any other state that did this. New Jersey, for example. Okay, yep, you got an income tax, and what happened? Well, the property taxes continue to rise, and now they also have an income tax. So don't fall for any shell game scenarios. It's not going to work. <laughs> Right. So again, broad-based taxes, right, uh, generally don't work. Um, I, I, I'm a big believer, I think it was Meldon Thompson saying that low taxes are a result of low spending. Exactly. Right. So if you want to lower your property tax, Tax's you, gotta, tax. you have to yeah. deal with your spending, mm -hmm. right, and, and, and get your spending under control. You may want the Taj Mahal for a town hall, but you may not be able to afford the Taj Mahal. Oh, yeah. Well, we have right? that on and the ballot so, in the town election. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. I was, no, no. wasn't making uh, no, any no, aspersions. And, no, it so. went down in flames. Yep. I mean, it was... Well, so, but but there's a good out. example, Anyone? local control, right? So your local control, I, I, I know up at, in my area, I'm from the Lakes region. Um, so up in my district, uh, the school board I served on, right, accounts for about s just shy of 60% of the total tax bill, right? So the, if you're going to deal with education, you, again, look at what's going on in your local. Get on your school board. Get on your, your school budget committee. See where the money's going, right, and why. That accounts for your, of your property taxes. That's the lion's share. Um, so... Get on the boards, find out uh, how they're spending, and, and, and deal with how that, and if you want low taxes, you've got to deal with how it's being spent. Just remember that government doesn't make money, right? We don't have a widget they we sell. We take all. other they people's money it. who did make a widget, and then, they ask and for then more. we spend it, yeah. right? And so, um, so I know I'm real cautious every time I want to spend a dollar. Um, I, re I always recognize it's somebody else's dollar that I'm spending. It's not mine, mm -hmm. right? And you got to pay attention to that, right? I know. It's easy right. to, it can be really easy to spend somebody else's money if you want. But um, 
So we have about 17 minutes left, yep. so I wanted to make sure we also talked about energy. If you're, I don't know how well versed you are in energy, I'm on the Science, Technology, and Energy mm -hmm. Committee for 10 years now. Mm -hmm. So uh, I learned a lot being on that committee about solar, wind, hydro, biomass, and hydrocarbons, mm -hmm. which, you know, they like to call them fossil fuels, but fossil fuels are actually hydrocarbons. Mm -hmm. and, and they're reliable. Mm -hmm. They're very reliable, and most people want to be able to turn on their lights at any time, day or night, run the AC, run the heater, and at the end of the month, they want to be able to pay the bill. Mm -hmm. Okay, we cannot run the state on just solar, wind, mm -hmm. hydro, biomass. We've got to have reliable sources of energy. We have to talk about um, the grid, making sure that it's stable. We, I don't know anybody that wants rolling blackouts like they have in California. I know I don't. And these are all important things to, to consider. Oh, absolutely. So again, when, you, when you're dealing with, everything has a cost-benefit analysis, right? Someone's going to pay the bill at the end, mm -hmm. right? And so you got to figure out what the cost is, what the benefit is, and whether that cost is worth it. Um, and so when you talk about things like solar, right, this is a good example, right, net metering. Um, net metering on its face sounds great. Yeah. But if you force the electric company to buy electricity at a higher rate they could buy on the market at wholesale, what's that going to do to electric rates? It's going to drive your rates up in some way, shape, or form, right? And so you can't you can't buy high and not sell higher, right? They'll go out of business, right? So um, so some of these forced mechanisms that happen around like net metering, which I'm a proponent of. I want grants, but I want you to understand that it should be done because if I want to do it on my house because I want to be a good steward of the earth, that's my choice, and it should be my my nickel that I that pays for it, not somebody else's nickel. Um, and so. Um, incentivizing some of these things, just understand um, that incentive comes from somebody. And it's either another rate payer or another taxpayer. Um, that's where that money comes to incentivize. When you see, oh, you get a $250 rebate for your new, new uh, uh, refrigerator, that $250 came from either a taxpayer or a rate payer, right? That's how they have the money to pay for that, mm -hmm. um, those rebates for energy efficiency. Um, so well, another thing to remember is that almost every single item has been ma manufactured using hydrocarbons or right. fossil fuels, if you want to. Mm -hmm. So your cell phone, your clothes, your furniture, yeah. and mattresses, everything. It, it, they use hydrocarbons to manufacture these items, including solar panels mm -hmm. and windmills. Right. And, and, and the elements that they, that, um, the rare earth minerals mm -hmm. that they extract from the earth to make to make an EV an electric vehicle mm -hmm. battery it's they're using hydrocarbons to make all these things right so. I, I don't know that's necessarily energy neutral when you say you know again solar or mm -hmm. wind or you know like the right now I, I think one of the big talking points is disposal mm -hmm. so we had a solar project in San Bernardino when I was on the zoning board we were looking at and one of the things we we're going to require of them was a bond for disposal um, so if they if the yeah, what project they do just with them? failed, I mean, I saw a picture right? of a bunch of yeah. solar, not not solar, um, windmill blades being mm -hmm. buried yep. in a field. I'm like, ah. Right. So again, so I know that we were as part of the solar requirement was to deal with decommissioning, right? What if this went defunct, right? We wanted a bond. We wanted to know that we could go to somebody and say, okay, we need to take all this down now, right? Because the business went out of business and went bankrupt, and we're stuck with this field full of solar panels. Right, and we need to dispose of them. Who's going to pay for it? And I don't want it to be the taxpayer, and so we require, as part of that project, we were requiring a bond for, for a decommissioning bond, to make sure that if they went out of business, were bankrupt, the bond would still be available to us to draw from to be able to dispose of what the problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, we have 13 minutes left. Excellent. What um, topics have I not co have we not covered that we should? Oh, what are we talking about over in the Senate besides marijuana? The House of Lords. The House of, the House Lords, of Lords, right? Lord, um, Lord so Land. cannabis is a big talking point. They're, oh. the, um, they're doing that in Senate uh, Finance today. Um, we passed it on the Senate floor with a bunch of amendments last week, um, and it went over to Finance, and Finance is looking at it today, and they had a whole slew of amendments to take up as well. Again, uh, look at the statute. So cannabis will be a uh, is a talking point. Um, sanctuary cities. It? Can they make? Oh, thank, yes. Sanctuary they, cities is another one. Well, before we get to sanctuary mm -hmm. cities, because I'm a real um, proponent of of not having sanctuary cities, but cannabis. Can mm -hmm. they do anything that make it not smell so bad? <laughs> Flavored cannabis. I don't I know mean, if they can do that. I mean, it just smells so. like everywhere that has legalized, yeah. you know, 
Canada well, so, just smells. so for me, <laughs> legalization, that's one of the prime, it's one of my prime issues is public consumption and making sure the penalty is strong enough to actually deter it um, so it doesn't happen. Um, and so um, I know that uh, Senator Whitley and I were at odds over this um, because uh, I wanted a little heavier penalties. She didn't, she wanted lighter penalties. Um, I wanted to be able to potentially threaten somebody with jail for the fifth time they've been charged with smoking in public after being told already it's illegal five, mm -hmm. four other times, right? That, okay, well, you're not learning your lesson, right? So maybe you need to spend a weekend in jail. Um, so I wanted tougher penalties uh, for public consumption. And it isn't because I'm against marijuana or anything else. I, I'm really agnostic. I really don't care one way or another. Oh, I passes. don't care what people do. I just yeah. don't want to. Uh, but for me, the issue is there was a study done that's, that was presented. I was on the uh, Cannabis Commission this summer. Um, and one of the studies that was presented in, in the hearing was the fact that it's about a one-third chance if you're exposed to secondhand cannabis smoke, you'll test positive. Oh, I, see, I wondered about that. And also little kids, yep. like you're pushing your child so, in the stroller so past Not that you're going to get high, right? So again, just passing through a cloud of smoke doesn't necessarily mean I'm going to get high because of that or have, have, a, have psychological effects to it. But it will show up in my system, mm. right? Now imagine that for a police officer who is walking by somebody who gets popped and then gets popped for a random drug test and tests positive knowing they don't consume. Wow. Imagine it for a truck driver. Never Imagine it for an airline pilot yeah. or a doctor, right? So that's why public consumption for me is so important is because you're not just affecting your life. You're affecting everybody around you with that cloud of smoke, right? Well, see, I never would have thought of that. Right? Yeah. So for me, like, so imagine having a top secret clearance and you lose your job, not because you smoked marijuana, but because you somebody popped next positive you and wow. someone else next to you did. Right, and so that's why public consumption for me is a big thing. Is it's not just relative to you, mm -hmm. what you do in your home. It's now you're bringing it. It can affect my life. Wow, I'm and, glad you brought that up. And so Thank for you. me, that's why public consumption penalties have to be high. Is because mm -hmm. you run the risk of problems for everybody else because you're trying to smoke a, you know, a joint in the, on the state house steps with fourth graders around. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now sanctuary cities because I've actually been to the border twice mm -hmm. and I did a special. Um, on what another chat with Janine presents, um, because I talked to the border um, border mm -hmm. patrol and mm -hmm. the sheriffs and ranchers and agriculture um, farmers, mm -hmm. and it's a serious serious issue with the having the borders wide open because people are just flooding flooding into America without being vetted. We don't know why they're here. We don't know what their intentions are. What are they going to do? There's so so I, I do want to clear up, Miss. again, our friends on the left like to angle us as an anti-immigrant policy, right? That, that, that's our, when we, when we say we don't want sanctuary cities. I want to always clarify so people understand what sanctuary cities are, right? So sanctuary cities are cities where the, the local government puts in policies that says law enforcement can't do something. So I use the uh, city of, I think it's Hanover, Lebanon. I always forget which one it is. It's one of those two, two up there. Um, they're, an anti, they're, a, uh, they're a sanctuary city. They have policies at the local government side. And it literally says that when a police officer runs uh, a name, it can make a flag for somebody. It can flag a name. And, and if INS uh, or ICE has a detainer request, it'll flag an INS say, oh, this police officer in, in Hanover, New Hampshire just ran this name and we have a warrant for him, mm -hmm. right? It can flag. And so they'll call Hanover, say, hey, we just saw you ran, you know, whatever name and we have a detainer request on them. In Hanover, the police aren't allowed to talk to ICE if they make that phone call. It's against town policy. You shall not cooperate is what the policy says. Right, so a police officer who does cooperate and says to the ICE law enforcement agent and says, yes, I have him in custody, he's at this location, could lose his job for doing that, right? So that's what sanctuary city policies are. Mm -hmm. They prohibit public officials, law enforcement, from cooperating with federal officials as it relates to immigration. So again, if, if I run somebody and again, that, that warrant pops up, I can't call INS and say, hey, I have this person, you have a warrant for him, um, what do you want me to do with them? And in some cases, they get nothing. In other cases, like, oh no, we have, you know, this guy's a, you know, we had one in New Hampshire, the guy in Rye, who was right. a multi-murderer, mm -hmm. right? And, and, yeah, and, we, right? Him, we talked about him on the, the yep. other show. And so, but 
if, if Rye was a sanctuary city, the law enforcement couldn't talk to the INS and right. tell them they and had him in custody when he was going to be drug released. Drug dealers any are protected in sanctuary yeah. cities. So child traffickers are are protected in sanctuary cities. Human traffickers have been, uh, so it's uh, a, people it's, of all ages. It's about setting local policies that prohibit local law enforcement from doing their job, right? And from and from answering inquiries. Um, and so when we say we don't want policies like that in New Hampshire, we don't want law enforcement, we don't to be prohibited from inter interacting with INS. Uh, up north, the Senate just went for a, a, a hike up north to the northern border um, and did, did that tour. Um, and there's a significant, um, I, I don't remember the percentage, so I don't want to quote one, but there was a significant increase in the right. number of border crossings that are being um, contacted and how many what they what they go is what they call known getaways. Is yes. People who got away who they knew about, but they just weren't able to in intercept them for whatever reason. And so dramatic on the northern border, um, the increase. Um, and, and we had a case here in New Hampshire, I think it was last summer, the summer before, where um, there was someone charged with human trafficking, right? They were bringing, they were currying people across for money, right, across. And, and that's where, you know, if you talk to anybody, uh, like I said, I was a police officer for a while. If you talk to anybody in the illicit sex trade, that's where a lot of those people come from are, are trafficked individuals who come either from China, from Mexico, from other places for, that are trafficked into here through an illegal border crossing and then are, are sex slaves, for lack of a better phrase. Oh, that's um, awful. And there's that's a significant awful. portion of that of that population that is that is in that sex trafficking market that are those type of people um, who are, are caught up in it. So I mean, the larger operations. And so um, drugs is again, an issue. it's still human trafficking, right? You're mm -hmm. smuggling a human being across the border, and you're doing it for money. And we had somebody charged right here in New Hampshire with that over. Uh, I think it was last summer and the summer before for carrying people across. And of course, drugs is, is always an issue. We, again, you know, we don't know, right? Second, so. oh, so my next guest is here for the next show. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, West Virginia has the highest fentanyl problem mm -hmm. and New Hampshire is second. Mm -hmm. so, so again, again it, we don't know all those known, not caught, right? Don't have no idea what they're carrying across mm -hmm. the border, right? So again, in an effort just to be in an abundance of caution, um, we should be protecting our northern border. You know, that we put into the budget, the Northern Border Alliance Program. Yes. Right? So $1.4 million. And, and the short version of that is that if the federal government's not going to protect our northern border, we'll pay our own cops to protect our northern border and to assist in that program. And that's what the $1.4 million is, to assist in um, that Swanson section they talked about. It's had a dramatic reduction in manpower. And so we're going to pay our cops, our county sheriffs, our, our local law enforcement, and our state police to, to help with that northern border and to interdict. Mm -hmm. Well, Lord Lang, you're very knowledgeable <laughs> on, on many topics, and I wish you all the best in your ca upcoming campaign for re-election, and thank, thank you. you. And, thank you, guys. Uh, don't forget to vote for Janine. Oh, you said my name right. <laughs> you know, she calls me Janine. I always I call her wrong. <laughs> so anyway, c good luck on your campaign as well. Thank you. So, thank you. And thank you for watching.